Good morning. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ensign Elena Roth, your Master of Ceremonies and member of the class of 2022. And I welcome you today to our annual white coat ceremony. At this time, please silence your cell phones. I invite you to enjoy a musical prelude by the Apollo Society at this time as we prepare for our ceremony to begin.
Thank you, Apollo Society. For those of you who may be having difficulty viewing the ceremony, please know that there is streaming in Building C, in Lecture Halls C1 and in C2, as well as in Sanford Auditorium, which is right around the corner. We will begin the ceremony momentarily if you wish to relocate now. This ceremony has been an important part of USU culture for nearly 20 years, and we are so excited to be back in person to celebrate this incredible event. We are here to welcome our newest colleagues into the medical profession in a time where we so obviously need their bright minds to tackle some of the most challenging problems. Thank you to the class of 2025 for your attendance. I also want to extend a warm welcome to the family members friends, and mentors who are showing support for our medical students and the university on this momentous day. At this time, I would like to invite all who are able to rise to do so for the arrival of the official party. I would like to introduce the members of your official party. Dr. Eric Elster, Dean of the F. Edward Ebert School of Medicine. Colonel Patrick Donahue, Brigade Commander, Uniformed Services University. Dr. Catherine Kimball Ayers, Commandant of the F. Edward Ebert School of Medicine. Dr. Pamela Williams, Associate Dean for Student Affairs of the F. Edward Ebert School of Medicine. Dr. Ashley Marinich, Assistant Dean for Clinical Sciences of the F. Edward Ebert School of Medicine. Dr. Ryan Landall, Assistant Dean for Preclinical Sciences of the F. Edward Ebert School of Medicine. Dr. Kameha Bell, Assistant Dean for Wellbeing Program of the F. Edward Ebert School of Medicine. Dr. Robert Leota, Associate Dean for Recruitment and Admissions of the F. Edward Ebert School of Medicine and today's guest speaker. Commander David Alexander, Brigade Chaplain, Uniformed Services University. At this time, I would like to invite all who are able to stay standing to acknowledge our distinguished visitors with us today. Rear Admiral Brian Monahan, attending physician of the United States Congress, professor of medicine and pathology at USU, father to and guest of Ensign Claire Monahan. Brigadier General Terrence Adams, military deputy director of concepts and strategy and guest of second Lieutenant Brittany Hume Dawson. Brigadier General, U retired United States Army, Vernon Spaulding, grandfather to and guest of Second Lieutenant Raymond Spaulding. Glenn Harms, First Secretary of the United States Consulate, Dubai, Senior Foreign Service, father to and guest of Second Lieutenant Sabrina Harms. The Dermatones, USU's student choir will now perform the national anthem. If you are able, please stay um, standing and military members come to attention for the singing of the Star Spangled Banner.
Thank you, Dermatones. The USU chaplain, Commander David Alexander, will now say the opening prayer for this ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to pray with me. O oh God, who undergirds the best of our traditions, who grants us strength to live up to our sacred vows. Here we gather with our military's newest generation of oath-bearing healers. We gather to bestow on them a coat a coat of simple cut, of a single color, a coat not designed to be flashy, yet nevertheless it stands out to the world as a beacon of hope in the most desperate of situations. It is a coat which in our iconoclastic times still stands tall as a universal symbol of tireless service which will exhaust every good option, climb any mountain, as it were, forge any river in order to save or aid a life. Indeed, some of the men and women in this room will in a very few short years find themselves practicing medicine in deadly places. They will wear their coats then only on the inside as they mount armored vehicles, board planes, helicopters, landing crafts, slip into parachute harnesses and cross gangways in order to stay close to the warriors whom they have sworn to serve. With this always in mind here at USU, we ask your blessing on these simple garments. Let not one coat be offered or accepted today unless it carries your own strength and humility. We ask this for our students, but also for the good of our nation and its warriors at home and abroad. Amen. You, will, you may all be seated, thank you. Thank you, Chaplain. My name is Ensign Carolina Surhan, a current member of the class of 2022 and a representative, representative of USU's Gold Humanism Honor Society. I would like to speak briefly about the significance of the white coat ceremony and its origins. The Gold Foundation established the white coat ceremony in 1993 at Columbia University. Specifically, the founder of the Gold Foundation, Dr. Arnold P. Gold, a professor at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons, noted that the practice of having students take the Hippocratic Oath at the end of their medical training unfortunately occurred four years too late. And therefore, he established the first white coat ceremony at Columbia at the beginning of clerkships in 1993 to emphasize the importance of humanism and compassion in medicine. Since then, nearly every medical school in North America has adopted this practice. Additionally, the Gold Humanism Honor Society has accompanied this tradition with a white coat pin to be worn on the lapel of the coat to help remind students of the significance of this oath. It is also my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for the class of 2025 white coat ceremony, Captain Robert Leota. Captain Leota, is a distinguished graduate of the Naval Academy, graduating in 1997, and a 2001 graduate of the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences F. Edward A. Bear School of Medicine. After completing his intern year in general surgery at the Na National Naval Medical Center in Bethesda, he was selected for additional training at the Naval Aerospace Medical Institute in Pensacola, Florida, where he earned designation as a Naval Flight Surgeon in 2003. He deployed several times during this and even met his wife, a Marine officer and combat engineer, 
during one of his deployments. In July 2005, Captain Leota began his residency in diagnostic radiology at the National Naval Medical Center, graduating in June 2009. He served as radiology department head to the Naval Hospital Lemoore in California for two years, after which he was selected for fellowship training in cardiothoracic radiology at the University of Michigan. In addition to helping establish the first lung cancer screening program within the DOD, Captain Leota accrued many other prestigious titles and occupations. In June of 2019, Captain Leota was appointed to serve as the Associate Dean for Recruitment and Admissions at the Uniformed Services University. He is board certified by the American Board of Radiology and an assistant professor at USU. His military decor decorations are too many to name here because perhaps even more importantly to the students here today, Dr. Leota serves as a stunning example of humanism in all things. It only takes one conversation to see how genuinely invested he is in the success and well being of each and every student at USU. His candor, humility, and belief and the good in all humans is what we hope to emulate. Please welcome Dr. Leota to the podium. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you. Uh, thank you for this. To begin, I would like to welcome and thank everyone in attendance today. I have had the opportunity to give many talks in my life. However, this opportunity to address your class on this day for your white coat ceremony ranks among the most precious privileges and honors that I've experienced as a physician. As we take this time to celebrate in pro your progress and your accomplishments, I encourage you to make this a tradition after every milestone. It is important to reflect and give yourself a psychological pat on the back after every victory along the way. Be sure to celebrate the progress in a special way after every test, clerkship, clinical rotation, and promotion to name a few. Sometimes this celebration will be in solitude and at other times, like today, you will invite others to celebrate with you. So as we come here today, I first wanna share two stories with you. The first story, many of us know the name of the infamous mobster Al Capone. He virtually owned Chicago. Capone wasn't famous for anything heroic. However, he was notorious for enmeshing the Windy City in everything from illegal trafficking of liquor and prostitution to murder. Capone had a lawyer nicknamed Easy Eddie, and he was Capone's legal counsel for a good reason. Easy Eddie was a wealthy owner of several dog racing tracks who came to Chicago from St. Louis, Missouri. He operated racetracks in Chicago, Miami, and Boston after he acquired a patent for a mechanical rabbit uh, that would actually go along the track and the dogs would race after it. Eddie was very good. In fact, Eddie's skills as a lawyer kept Capone out of jail for a long time. And to show his appreciation, Al Capone paid him very well. Not only was the money big, but Eddie got special privileges. For instance, his family occupied a fenced in mansion with live and help and all the conveniences of the day. The estate was so large that it took up an entire block in Chicago. Eddie lived the high life with the mob and gave little consideration to the atrocities associated with that lifestyle. He did have a family though, and he had three children, two daughters and a son. Eddie made sure his children had the best clothes, cars, a solid education. Nothing was withheld for them. Price was no object. And despite his involvement with organized crime, Eddie still tried to teach his children good from bad or right from wrong. Some have said that he truly hoped and dreamed that his son would be a better man than him one day. With all his wealth and influence though, there were two things he couldn't give his kids. He couldn't pass on a good name and he couldn't show a good example. One day, Easy Eddie had a difficult decision. He had a chance to rectify the wrongs he had done. With the help of a reporter named John Rogers, he turned over a series of Capone's financial records to the Internal Revenue Service, which gave prosecutors the evidence they needed to finally put Capone behind bars. After Easy Eddie testified against the mob, Al Scarface Capone was subsequently imprisoned in Alcatraz from August of 1933 through November of 1939. Many have said that without Easy Eddie's contributions to the investigation, there would have never been a case against Capone. As a result of this action though, Eddie's life ended in a blaze of gunfire on a lonely street in Chicago. A week before Capone's release from Alcatraz in November of 1939, Easy Eddie was shot to death by two gunmen driving along his car as he was coming home from the racetrack. 
The shooters were likely hitmen acting out of retaliation for putting Capone behind bars. However, this was never proven. In the end, though, Easy Ed as he gave his children the greatest gift he had to offer at the greatest price that he would ever pay. That's the first story. The second story. World War II produced many heroes. One such man was Lieutenant Commander Edward Butch O'Hare. Butch O'Hare was a graduate of the United States Naval Academy, class of 1937. Upon graduation, he was selected to become a fighter pilot and was assigned to an aircraft carrier, the USS Lexington, in the South Pacific. On February 20th, 1942, Butch's squadron was tasked with a bombing mission. And after he was airborne, he looked at his gauge and he saw that his fuel wasn't topped off. And as a result, he told his, his flight leader, he said, um, I still want to go, but I'm not going to make it back to the ship. His reluctantly, and his flight leader said, you need to turn back. You need to go back. And reluctantly, he dropped out of formation and headed back to the ship. As he was returning to the ship, though, he saw something that turned his blood cold. A squadron of Japanese aircraft were speeding towards the aircraft carrier. The American fighters were all gone on their sortie, and the ship was left defenseless. Given his position and the location of the Japanese bombers, he did not have a time, enough time to go back and get the squadron, and he also had no time to notify the ship. There wasn't any time, and he only had one option in his mind. Laying aside all thoughts of his own personal safety, he dove into that formation of Japanese planes. Wing-mounted 50 calibers blazed as he charged in, attacking one surprised enemy plane and then another. Butch wove in and out of that broken formation, and he broke it up, and he fired at as many planes as possible. Undaunted, he continued the assault. He dove at the planes trying to clip wings or tails, tail um, rudders in hopes of damaging and incapacitating them. Demonstrating remarkable marksmanship, he singly handled down single-handedly downed several Japanese bombers and attacked them until he ran out of ammo. As a result of his actions, the exasperated Japanese squadron ultimately took off in another direction. Deeply relieved, Butch O'Hare and his tattered fighter limped back to the carrier. Upon arrival, he reported the events surrounding his return. The film from the gun camera mounted on his plane told the tale. It showed the extents of Butch's daring attempt to protect the ship. He had in fact destroyed five enemy aircraft, and severely damaged the sixth in the squadron of the nine Japanese planes that were heading their way. For Butch's actions, he became the Navy's first ace of World War II and the first naval aviator to win the Medal of Honor. Upon returning home, he was an instant celebrity. Um, he was met with fanfare and parades and even got invited to the White House to meet Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uncomfortable with all the attention and fanfare though, Butch asked to return to the war. A year later, at the age of 29, O'Hare led the U.S. Navy's first ever nighttime fighter attack from an aircraft carrier. During this encounter with a group of Japanese torpedo bombers, O'Hare's Grumman F-6F Hellcat was shot down and the aircraft was never found. Although O'Hare was lost at sea, he would never return to the United States. His hometown did not allow his memory to fade though. And in now today, Chicago O'Hare International Airport bears his name as a tribute to the courage of this great man. Between Terminals 1 and 2, a memorial displays his statue and his Medal of Honor. So you now may be asking, what do these two stories have to do with each other, and why did I choose to share them? The answer to the first question is this. The, the link between these two stories is that Lieutenant Commander Edward Butch O'Hare was Easy Eddie's son with that. I chose these stories to share with you today, however. Um, I could, have shown, I could have told any story to you today that would have talked about the human condition and the human story that we all have. Within our profession and really all professions, the work we do is all about the people. Back in 2015, the director of Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, General Jeffrey B. Clark, shared a quote with us from Pope St. John Paul II, which captures the essence, essence of these stories and your roles as healthcare providers and leaders. While sharing his leadership philosophy, General Clark made the following statement. Every person is unique, precious, and unrepeatable. I repeat, every person is unique, precious, and unrepeatable. As a healthcare provider, you have the privilege of seeing people when they are most vulnerable. Your white coat identifies you as one who is there to listen and help. Moreover, it doesn't matter who you are seeing. Each life, just as Al Capone's, Easy Eddie's, and Lieutenant Commander Edward Butch O'Hare's was and are unique, precious and unrepeatable. 
Our nation has entrusted you with the care of all lives, our most precious assets, and that trust bears a significant amount of responsibility. You have been given great responsibility, and that responsibility demands profound selflessness, selflessness, humility, and love. When you start your clerkships, it will be difficult as you continue to learn your trade and are forced to rotate to a new specialty every six weeks. Just when you feel like you start to get the job and feel more comfortable with it, we send you away on another rotation. This can be stressful and lead to doubt about your abilities. However, I don't want you to ever forget that your role matters. Your patients will look to you for answers and you will have the distinct privilege to listen and know your patients, often better than anyone else on the healthcare team. You will, if not already, certainly experience this great privilege and reward for the hard work and selfless service. There are times, as you already know, when you are tired, when you are worn out, when you are stressed, and you desperately want to take a break. However, it is during these moments that patients will likely need you the most. If you remain steadfast and patiently see the good in everyone and everything, you can be assured that there will be great peace and joy in appreciating this great profession and privilege to serve others as both a physician and as an officer. Each of you are unique, precious, and unrepeatable just as your patients and those entrusted with your care and leadership. As you go forward, always put character first and just do the next right thing without worrying about any past failures or mistakes or what the future will bring. You are all on a great adventure and I am excited to, for each of you and your careers. Getting to speak to you today has been yet another great privilege of our profession. And thank you for allowing me to be a part of this special day with you and your loved ones. Thank you. Captain Leota, thank you for speaking this morning. Uh, as the Associate Dean for Recruitment, uh, and admissions, you played a pivotal role in the beginning steps of all of our careers here in medicine. And then your words today are particularly profound. So thank you for speaking. On behalf of the class of 25, we will be sponsoring a brick for you out in the courtyard, which will go in the admissions portion, okay? Um, so again, on behalf of our class, thank you very much. Um, thank you for everything that you have done and that you will do for this class, this university, and for this country. Thank you. We will now begin the donning of the white coats. I invite Dr. Kamea Bell to the podium, who has been selected by the class of 2025 to read their names and for the official party to stand for the donning of the white coats. Thank you. Christopher Bernie, Bridget Doughton, David Carras, Aidan McQuaid, Matthew Rawls, Maria Satry, Bailey Sheeve, Alyssa Tembero. Grayson Clark. Brittany Hume Dawson, Grant Kelly, Christopher Kuhn, Maria Marina Lazaridis, Zachary Matais, Natalie Pluta, Megan Reese. Jezralyn Lulaklak, Zachary Flash, Amanda Fortin, 
Timothy Ho, Hannah Lee, Scott Opplinger, Je Crystal Wong. Evan Bradenberg, Abigail Delormano, Kimberly Dodd, Ronnie Dowd, Ian McCalla, Michael Pacheco, Brooke Smith. Jonathan Buczynski, Ketra Dekinich, Benjamin Huang, Glenn Lucier, Will Sherman, Kaylee Sinople, Marina Weinberger, Anthony White. Kevin Beeman Brown, Courtney Bishop, G. Kim, Connor McGuire, Isabella Penquit, Carly Steffen, John Wanacott. Carl Kaling, Maura Gately, Annie Lee, Sarah Lim, Anthony Overfield, Annika Patterson, Chase Swardvik. Catherine Benskin, Elise Babachinski, Noah Brunner, Jin Boom Dupont, Pranish Katwa, Calista Martin, Keely Phillips, Benjamin Shamban. Elizabeth DeLay, Brandon Hillary, Roland Kiendrabago, Christian Kim, Victoria Nguyen, Nicole Saparito, Cameron Sullivan. Reese Beard, Laura Bellows, Scott Clausen, Joshua Rajaratnam Hughes, Mitchell Rand, Sydney Rogers, Jiang Yang, Georgia Stanovich. Jeffrey Boma, Om Chitness, Cole Crandall, Abigail Crozier, Claire Kinsella, Caroline Kwan, Dominique Smith Dolio, Samatina Tulias. Dale Knight, Vera Funk, Andy Guan, Caitlin Ye.
Amber Barak, Susanna Del Rio, Zachary Jones, Michael Payne, Christian Perez, Raymond Spalding, Caitlin Strickland, and Claire Sturick. Brent Bubini, Megan Eiler, Stephanie Fortin, Caleb Hudson, Ariana Lopez, Candace Metcalf, Bright Mills, Jackson Rudolph. Sarah Brainerd. William Brooks, Cedric Fry, Kathleen Yeftik, Robert McKay, Alexis Russell, Hadley Thomas, Samantha Williamson. Braden Besant. Emily Davis Horning, Haley Donaldson, Debrashi Mitra, Mason Ramadelli, Joseph Ree, Ananya Tripathi, Kenneth Zaleski. Avery Bastemeyer. Juan Bui, Meredith Fig, McKenna Goshgarian, Michael Weisel, Kyrie Simmons, Winston Wu. Apoorva Shavali, Alex, Alex Cherry, Benjamin Epstein, Sabrina Harms, Joshua Rice, Chase Schulte, Shelby Skidmore. Isaac Houston, N.J. Kim, Giovanni Reyes Matoa, Matoda, Amanda Samuel, Alice Sardarian, Jackson Storm, Maria Tischer, Shelby Wuss. Nelly, Dorogat, Dor sorry, Nelly Gorodetsky, N.J. Young, John Bertrand Kalima, Caitlin Ku, Colin McCarty, Renee Roulette, Anne Sidwell, Jonathan Wong. Peyton Brisso, Mongshon Lee, Ryan McLaughlin, Christian Song, Adam Steniger, Hannah Stewart, Jackson Watkins, Renee Wilson. Austin Chin, New Chin, Anne Guadalupe, Colton Jewell, Andrew Metter, Andrea Sparks, Kayla Wands.
Benjamin Friedman, Joanna Klensak, Nicole Marr, Matthew Miller, Claire Monahan, Adam Ostergaard, Emily Stapleton, John Paolo Torre. William Bowers, Seth Holmquist, Juliana O'Reilly, Samantha Ori. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Dr. Elster will now administer the oath of Hippocrates. Looks good. Feels great. I invite all physicians and students of the class of 2025 to raise their right hand and repeat after me. Please stand. I do solemnly swear that I will be loyal to the profession of medicine and just and generous to its members, that I will lead my life and practice my art in uprightness and honor, that into whatever home I shall enter, it shall be for the good of the sick and the well to the utmost of my power, and that I will hold myself aloof from wrong and from corruption and from the tempting of others to vice, that I will exercise my art solely for the cure of patients and the prevention of disease and that I will give no drugs and perform no operation for a criminal purpose and far less suggest such a thing. That whatsoever I shall see or hear of the lives of persons which is not fitting, fit, fitting to be spoken, I will keep secret these I, do promise. These I do promise, and in proportion as I am faithful to this oath, and in proportion as I faithful to this oath. May, happiness and good repute be ever mine. may happiness and good repute be ever mine, the opposite if I shall be forsworn. The opposite if I shall be forsworn. Congratulations to the class of 25. You may lower your hands. And just before I sit down, let's give a round of applause for the team for putting this together today. Ladies and gentlemen, this completes our ceremony. I ask you to remain in place for the departure of the official party. I would now like to invite all of you to join us in the Hall of Flags for the reception. Congratulations, students, you were dismissed.